My name is Pamela Brett McLean. I am an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, and also the director of the Arts and Humanities and Health and Medicine program uh, in the faculty. And it is in relation to this role that I um, had the great fortune to meet Marilyn Oliver uh, last year when she, uh, over the course of several conversations, introduced me to the laser series, which has resulted in us all gathering here tonight. Um, she suggested that we apply to become a host site, and, uh, and so here we are, and looking forward to a wonderful evening. And I just want to recognize Marilyn first for bringing this and her inspired vision. Um, and we welcome both of us, all of you. You'll hear from Marilyn very, very shortly. <coughs> and sort of working out this PowerPoint. Um, just a little bit of information about the laser series. Um, it was founded in 2008 by laser chair Piero Scarufi um, on behalf of Leonardo Isist. Now, laser stands for, um, of course, you see it here, Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. Isist stands for the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology. This is one of many activities and programs that uh, is supported um, by, the, uh, by the organization. Uh, Marilyn will provide additional details. But I might just note that we are one of over 20 international host sites for laser talks series. And the University Laser U Alberta is one of the newest. So um, we will have more information and uh, to share with you around additional opportunities and presentations that will be coming up this year. We are really excited that we've been able to start so early with such a wonderful um, uh, group of presenters. Um, what I'm going to be sort of doing after this, because I'm giving it over to Marilyn, is during the course of the evening, uh, we've distributed question cards. If you have questions that you'd like to bring forward or, or ask of, of the group or any one presenter, I'm going to be collecting. Kind of, you know, put your card up and I'll collect it. Often there are a number of questions that are kind of similar or can build on one another. We're going to try to manage time this evening because we're also going to be having an after um, uh, evening component uh, in, in the spirit of the laser evenings, which also emphasizes networking and socializing and sharing all of our ideas together in an informal way. So um, there are some more cards here. Uh, as Marilyn takes over, you can put up your hand and I'll distribute additional cards if you didn't receive them yet. But thank you, Marilyn. Um, as Pam said, I have been watching these laser talks happening all over the world since 2009. I get, I don't know if anybody um, doesn't know about the Leonardo Art and Science Journal, it's a really fantastic journal. And there's also a great um, sign up to um, get emails and they always send information about these laser talks. So what's so great about us being part of this laser network is that what we do here is shared all across the world with all the other laser hosts. And what they, what they have is also shared with us. So we become part of an international network, um, which is really exciting. Because I just joined um, University of Alberta last August. And very soon, I was just blown away by how many amazing art and science projects happen here at the um, university and in Alberta. And so I had no hesitation in applying um, to become a host. And, and they didn't hesitate in accepting us. So um, I'm really proud of that. And I hope they will continue to do a really great laser series. I'll just quickly flag up um, this slide. This will be an ongoing program. So we're aiming to have two presentations per term. So that'll be four a year. We won't be doing it in, in spring and summer. So if you have, if you are interested in becoming a speaker or have any um, interesting art and science projects you'd like to share, please do email me. And we'll be, uh, we have a committee, we meet regularly and we'll be um, structuring these talks. Uh, we also give a little session for, this is part of the laser um, structure, is that we have news from the audience. So if you have any art and science projects which you'd like to share with this audience of like minds, then you'll have an opportunity to share those. And then um, 
as Pam said, we also have a, we'll have a little mingling session in the Fab Gallery after this. Where there'll be wine and cheese, so please do join us for a more informal discussion. <sighs> I'd like to thank all the people that um, have supported us. The, um, the Kias has very generously um, agreed to fund us in our first year. Um, and also all the deans of the various departments and chairs that have agreed to support us. Sorry, that my PowerPoint seems to be doing some funny things. <laughs> okay, but with no further ado, I'm sure you've all come to hear our wonderful speakers. Um, our first speaker is Sean Caulfield. Then we have Daniel Laforé, and then Minion. Um, I'm delighted that Sean agreed to be part of the first laser. Um, Sean, I met Sean first in 2009, when he invited me to be part of the Perceptions of Promise project, which looked at stem cell research. And ever since then, Sean has been doing continuous, amazing art and science projects. Um, his work is outstanding, as everybody knows, has been shown in Canada, um, in the US, in Japan, in Europe. He's won many, many awards. Um, and just this year alone, he's won the sixth annual Eldon and Ant Ut Edmondson Visual Arts Prize, and he was recently elected to the Royal Society of Canada, which I think hasn't been acknowledged. Can we all just say? <laughs> well done, Sean. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Daniel Laboré. Um, Soon after joining the U of A, I became um, aware of Daniel's research by seeing uh, a call about his course on the Faculty of Arts um, website on cultures of the body, body, medicine, health, life, and storytelling. Um, I sadly I wasn't able to take it that term, but when I get time, if ever I get time, I will call it that class because it sounds fascinating. Um, Daniel works is an associate professor of French and cultural studies in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies. He's been a visiting professor at the Stanford University Center for Biomedical Ethics. He's an alumni of the Fulbright Foundation, as well as of the Bant Center Leighton Artist Colony. And earlier this year, Daniel was awarded a prestigious Shirk Insight Grant for his research project, The Biomedical Body and Everyday Life in Quebec and Canada. And finally, I'll talk by Min Yun, who comes from the School of Dentistry, which is really exciting that um, you're part of this first event, which is about art and science collaborations. Um, Min's research is um, focused on the improving oral health and care of vulnerable populations. She's committed to not only enhancing awareness of head and neck cancer, but also integrating this commitment into educational curricula that honors people and their individual experiences. Min also led the Flux exhibition, which hopefully many of you, many of you had the opportunity to see this year. So, Thank you, and uh, I'm looking forward to this talk. All right, good evening, everyone, and <clears throat> thank you very much for that introduction, and a uh, huge thanks for inviting me to this uh, event. <coughs> it's uh, great, exciting to be here. So um, there's a few familiar faces in the audience, so some of this will be old, but uh, hopefully I give it a new spin. Um, so as was noted, over the last 10 years, I've had the pleasure of working on a lot of kind of interdisciplinary projects, uh, particularly in biomedicine, but in other areas too. Um, and I was first sort of brought into this work uh, through my brother, who's, uh, as some of you may know, a professor in law, does work in bioethics. And our first project we did together was called Imagining Science, uh, in which we brought a really interdisciplinary team together. Um, and I sort of skipped over that project in the interest of time, but the next one we did was called Perceptions of Promise. And as was noted, we decided to focus on stem cell research. Uh, why stem cell research? Uh, I guess we were interested in it because it was um, a topic that can be so polarizing. Uh, it's complex ethically, particularly around embryonic stem cells, right? Um, and especially, I, I think still, but at that time it seemed quite, quite to be a, a heightened time around that, uh, that topic. So we, we were just wondering what role interdisciplinary research could do in sort of having more complex discussions around stem cell research, and also the role art could play maybe in, in kind of um, contributing to that dialogue. So uh, a quick image, I think one of the things I want to stress in, in talking about all of these projects is bringing together 
these interdisciplinary groups and how important that is and how kind of rich that experience is. Uh, this is just a group shot uh, at the Banff Center for the Arts. So we met there for three, day, three days, had a three-day workshop, exchanged ideas, exchanged research, and then began to work towards how we might collaborate together for an exhibition and for a publication. So that's, I think, a key thing to note, uh, that experience, uh, at least from, from my experience working on these projects, is having these moments when you can have these face-to-face -face times uh, to really talk through things. Uh, to start this project, for me, uh, I've always had a long interest in the history of medical illustration, in the history of print and medicine, printmaking and medicine. So I began to look at um, a lot of medical images, particularly uh, William Hunter's famous a a atlas from 1789 on pregnancy, pregnancy and pathology. Uh, given the topic around embryonic stem cells, it seemed like an appropriate thing to look at. So I won't go into it. There's lots we could, we could spend a whole night just talking about an Im image, but uh, all I will say is that I was very drawn to this particular image uh, on an emotional level. Um, it is, of course, an image about knowledge. It's about learning about the body, understanding the body, but it's visceral. It's a tr tremendously visceral image. Uh, it's disturbing to look at, but at the same time, it's quite compelling and beautiful. And that push-pull in it is something I think was really interesting. And I think in terms of what art can do, this is a good uh, kind of place to think about that kind of push-pull that happens in all art, and in this case, visual art. Uh, the next thing that happened because of this conference, and I always make this joke, has anyone been to a stem cell conference? <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Um, it's a very, it was very, we, because it was a stem cell project, I ended up going to a lot of these uh, science conferences, and it was a very interesting experience. As someone in the arts and humanities, I'm not going to lie, it felt very intimidating. I'd go to these conferences, I felt like, whew, you know, all this stuff was going over my head. Highly specialized, um, you know, research and knowledge, uh, and it's difficult to access it. So this was the kind of image, uh, you know, imagery that would be in a lot of the presentations. And I started to go into visual art mode. I was like, oh, that's an interesting image. And I'd see it kind of formally, and I would have no idea on a specialized level what was going on. And so for me, that in itself became an interesting topic. Uh, here we have this incredibly important technology, uh, technology that's transformative, like, you know, it's complex ethically. Uh, but to really understand it, there's a very specialized group that really understands it. And that tension to me is very interesting. And so I thought that in itself is maybe something I could try to explore in my work. So for the project, I did a series of drawings. Um, and I worked. Um, on these drawings, somewhat collaborating with this gentleman right here, Royden Mills, who made a sculpture. And I'm just realizing that I might have forgotten our group shot. I apologize. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was working on these drawings, and um, I tried to achieve a number of things. I, I hope the drawings spoke to kind of a history of illustration, medical illustrations, so that they had that quality about them. I hope that the the images spoke to the body, but in this kind of unusual way, this sense that you kind of understood and understood the image but couldn't quite understand the image, that sort of distance I talked about earlier. Um, I also wanted the drawings to have a little bit of a push-pull emotionally. Again, I talked about that with the, with the historic image, where they're kind of whimsical, uh, funny perhaps even on one hand, but also perhaps slightly unsettling on the other hand. Um, and that that polarized kind of feeling reflects maybe this polarized debate that might go on around technology like stem cell research. Um, yes, sorry, Roy, I got the wrong slide. Uh, here's an installation shot of the drawings uh, at the Chelsea Art Museum. Um, and you can see they're about the height of the figure, figure uh, body height, and they're on drafting film. They're ink and silk screen on drafting film, and they're suspended just slightly off of the wall. Uh, the next project I worked on uh, was called The Body in Questions. Uh, and this is an image of uh, Marilyn Oliver's piece, um, and who also, I should have mentioned, participated in the Procession of Promise. Or I guess she did. Uh, and she also participated in this project. Again, we had uh, kind of an inter interdisciplinary team. However, the method here in this project was different. And that's another thing that's interesting to think through, is how you think about method when you bring different groups together. 
in this case, this project was very much headed by Isabel Van Grimm, a uh, choreographer from Montreal. And I, she offered us a lot of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary material, uh, research from uh, academics and from scientists, also kind of reflections on the body from different people. Uh, and the project itself, you know, my view of it was to think about how technology is changing the perceptions of our own body. I would say it's kind of one of the main kind of questions it asked. Um, and she very much, I guess in a way, I, I viewed her as a kind of a director for the whole piece. Uh, that she gave us a lot of le leeway, a lot of creative latitude, but she sort of guided the, the larger project in many ways. Uh, so this, I think, is a great image uh, and, and speaks in many ways to the power of art, I think, to talk about complex things. We have this very interesting and complex image where we have a projection of a digital image of a figure, a a sculpture based on digital imagery in the middle there based on CT scans, right? Uh, and then uh, uh, the feathers in the bottom speaking to the figure but in a kind of more organic way. And then finally, of course, the figure itself on the bottom. So in a very quick, succinct way, we get this very complex image, uh, which I think, again, speaks to maybe the, the effect of the, the power of art to talk about complexity in a, in a succinct way. Uh, the project I made, I collaborated with Royden Mills, um, Blair Brennan, who's in the back there, and Brian Webb. And we made a sort of larger <coughs> installation. And uh, in this installation piece, we brought together a large sculpture in the front, that sculptural form. There was tools uh, made by both Royden and Blair in the back. And then I did a series of drawings that we sort of uh, hung across this, the wall. I think, uh, from my perspective, in, in, in many ways, many of the artists in this project were thinking about the body and maybe the future of how the, it might change due to technology or how new technologies change the way we perceive the body. But from my perspective, I sort of felt like we were kind of in some ways looking back. How does a simple tool affect the way we think about our body? How does something as small as that kind of shift? So in a way, ours, ours sort of, this is maybe a simplification, but look back a little bit while others look forward. Uh, some details of the drawings. Again, ink, silk screen on drafting film. Again, they very much spoke to the body, the forms in the body, uh, the history of anatomi anatomical illustration. Uh, the project also involved dance. And in many ways, one of the things I found interesting about this project was um, Isabel, I think, set up a situation where it was very equivocal. The, the artwork wasn't meant as a backdrop for the dancers, but rather that they were supposed to kind of work together. And I think that was a really interesting aspect of the project. It was also very interesting that it took place in a gallery. So as a viewer, you walked into the gallery space and interacted directly with sculptural forms or, or, or images, and also with physical bodies moving. So that was very interesting to me as well. Very briefly, I wanted to say that in my practice, I've, over the last 10 years, I found it somewhat divided. And I mean by that, that I'll do these interdisciplinary projects that involve kind of teams. Uh, and at the same time, I have what I might call, for lack of a better word, an individual studio practice. Acknowledging, of course, that we're always borrowing and getting out from everyone all the time. Um, and anyway, I just wanted to point out that I think even when I work sort of more alone, the work I do in, in these other projects filters in and affects uh, what I'm doing. So there's this kind of cross-pollination that happens. Uh, Min is going to talk about this project uh, shortly, so I won't go into great deal detail about this, except that it was a real pleasure to also participate in the Simi Hirmi Hilmi project, and I produced a piece uh, for that project as well. And again, another interesting interdisciplinary uh, collaboration where we looked at uh, recovery illness uh, around head and neck cancer. So I'm looking at time here. I've got five minutes left. Um, and I'll get to my last project. So the most recent project I've been working on is, is called Immunations. Um, and in this project, we brought together, again, an inter interdisciplinary team. And we wanted to look at the issue or the theme of vaccines. Uh, I think like stem, cell net, stem cells, uh, why we're interested in vaccines is, again, it's a very polarized debate sometimes. Um, strong feelings around vaccines. Um, and again, wondering about what art 
what, what role art might play in kind of examining that. Um, we are also interested in what would happen if we could uh, create an exhibition or artworks that function not in a gallery, but in a, in a different kind of space, a uh, public policy space. So right from the beginning, the project was designed to eventually end up in a, in a public policy place, and it, it was eventually shown at um, uh, UNAIDS in Geneva during a World Health Organization conference. So the, the thinking there is that we could bring this work right to those kind of uh, policy people. So for this um, project, I uh, looked at Vesalius. Of course, many of you may know this famous work, 16th century anatomical uh, work. Um, and I very much wanted to draw on this as a kind of marker for a particular point in European Western medicine, as a kind of clear sign of that. And so I began to just draw on this. Uh, I began to scan this image. I began to ma manipulate it digitally uh, and just really play with it. I chose this uh, particular image from Vesalius because it's the vascular system and you know, vaccines, that sort of made sense. And also because of its graphic kind of presence and power. From that, I began to make smaller, smaller prints. And these are uh, digital and silk screen. And really what I began to try to explore is to make these invented anatomical forms that I would lay over top what is really a kind of empirical observation of the body. One of the things I was thinking about here is how pseudoscience um, adopts scientific language uh, when presenting ideas sometimes. And I wondered about that complexity. Um, I wondered about what does it mean to have empirical language and invented language? What happens when we mix them? Uh, what, is, what is the space in between that's kind of created? Um, I then made a life-size uh, print slash sculpture. It's not really it's kind of a sculpture. Uh, installation, print installation. Uh, so this is the full figure, life-size. And I began to, again, print my own kind of anatomical forms over top. This is a kind of layered image. Uh, many of you might, actually in the Vesalius, this was the case. But you might remember uh, going to schools, those anatomical books that you could pull kind of apart. Mm -hmm. So this, in a way, was a large version of that. You could kind of pull uh, layers of this drawing apart. So this is the installation at UNAIDS. And around the central figure, I had all the parts that I printed on the figure around in a kind of grid form. One of the interesting things about working in UNAIDS is that we did have the opportunity to be right in there in a kind of World Health Organization, kind of global summit situation where we could interact with policy people. That was fabulous. One of the challenges is how do you make work, artwork that functions that kind of space uh, effectively? So the way we worked towards that is we actually had three workshops. We had a workshop where we just met as an interdisciplinary team. Then we met again in Geneva to look at the space and think about how we might respond to it. And this was great because it allowed us to kind of break down interdisciplinary barriers a bit more. And then we had a third workshop in Norway where we sort of tested the show. And then finally, uh, this presentation of the work. Just a few more minutes here. Just some details of the work. Um, so these would be the side panels that were around the central panel. And a side view of the uh, piece. Um, one of the things I was mentioning, the challenge of trying to work in a different space, I just tried to take advantage of these, that architectural space and actually use the grid of the of the windows as a, part, a thing that participated in the grid of my own piece. And I, I also tried to use the light that came in from the, the back of the, of the architectural space as a way to kind of affect the piece. So during the course of the day, the, the nature of the piece would change. Um, just a few more minutes, and I'll kind of wrap up. But I do want to touch on a few of the other artists involved. Um, this is uh, Alison Humphrey and Kate, uh, Caitlin Fisher. They're both at York University, and they produced an interactive um, video piece where they created what they called shadow pox. So these sh pox would be projected on you, and you could actually kind of try to pull them off. Um, and they were interested in thinking about ways they could talk about people participating in getting vaccinated. So these are some stills from that. Oh, no, that's just one still. Another artist who's actually been here as a visiting artist several years ago was 
uh, Kaisu Hush. <coughs> and she produced a very interesting video uh, where she interviewed vaccine hesitant parents. Um, and I think this is again another good example of the great role art can play in some of these complex debates. She started the video with those interviews. She was very respectful to them, listened to them, wanted to know why they have these belief systems. And then the second part of the video was interviewing the doctors. So it kind of, I think, in a way, opened up a respectful dialogue. Um, so I think it's a, it's a quite an interesting, <coughs> interesting piece. Here's a, um, another still from the video. I'll just to show a few more pieces. This is Patrick Mann from Western University. And he worked with Anna, uh, actually the, one of the people at UN AIDS, Anna Marie Ho. Um, and they were thinking about, could you make an art piece that also, also potentially had a kind of function to it, a speculation about a place where people might get vaccinated. Uh, so he made these sort of sculptural forms printed on the outside. And uh, within them are narratives about vaccination, uh, narratives about needle, uh, fear of needles, narratives about um, why people are hesitant about vaccination again. I'm skipping over a few pieces. There was other interesting work about uh, working in, in uh, developing countries, that sort of thing, but again, in the interest of time. So I just wanted to end again to underscore for me how important it, was, it has been working with disciplinary teams. Uh, this is an example of a team for this project. I do want to make a special uh, acknowledgement to Natalie Lovelace and Vicky Kwan, who were enormously uh, helpful and fabulous colleagues. Um, and also to ignore it, I, I haven't gone over all the funding partners in it, all of these, again, in the interest of time, but I do want to stress that in this case, this was funded by the Norwegian Research Council, as well as the U of A, as well as SHRC. But the point I want to get to is this, in some ways, was a risky project to fund. And I think it's, it's great to see when funding agencies are willing to take the risk and say, okay, let's try something different. What we're doing isn't working, but so maybe there's some other avenues. Just to end, um, in connection to this project, uh, my brother and I have also worked on a publication that's coming up through Penguin uh, called The Vaccination Picture. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about that uh, if there's questions later. Uh, and one of the participating artists was Blair Brennan. Uh, and this is a great drawing slash collage, uh, Batman versus Smallpox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Just like Sean did, I'm going to extend my gratitude to, <clears throat> to Marilyn and, and Pam for being so proactive with, with that sort of gathering for bringing the lasers. I didn't know about the laser talks. I learned about them thanks to you. And now look at us. Awesome. So yeah, reading the biomedical body is the title of uh, it's the, it's the name for this research that I'm barely getting off the ground as we speak since I got had the pleasure of getting a shirt inside grant for it uh, this past spring. Uh, <clears throat> I'll have less results, obviously, to uh, to give you, and I'll have way more questions and potential developments and, and you know pathways and and whatnot to bring to the table tonight. So um, first thing I'm going to be doing is giving you a sense of where it's going, obviously. I mean, there's three, um, if you will, there's three directions that this research uh, will go, hopefully, if I have the time uh, during those, the upcoming years. The first direction, which is the one I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, highlighting and emphasizing tonight, is, uh, okay, so looking in you, it's kind of a weird way to put it, but it, so this is the first part of it, thinking the impact of medical visualism Visualization or visualization? Visualization. Visualization. Visualization uh, technologies on our narratives. Oh, sorry, typo there. Narrative representations of the body and the self. This is how my talk tonight has been sort of advertised. So this is what I'm going to be doing. It has to do, of course, with the individual personal narrative. So it's our life stories, basically. This is what I'm looking into with that first part of the research. Uh, okay, so there you go. Medical technologies. The second part, reading a new. This is upcoming. Building a bridge, I really want to do that. Building a bridge between Canadian literary studies, which is my background. This is where I come from. And health humanities at large, the discipline, by coming up with, I have a pompous name for it because I needed to put something that would carry some weight in the grant application. But it does say what it is. An online critical depository on health and biomedical literary works. Basically, it's to have a team of people coming up with what one could call an, an annotated but a bibliography of fiction and nonfiction works in Canada across the board that touch upon health, illness, 
the biomedical body, so that people in uh, practitioners and theoreticians and, and professors and health humanities and instructors and students will be able to consult it. So that's a concrete bridge between the literary people and uh, the health humanities people in Canada and abroad. And so this, I'm not going to uh, spend a long time on this because this is just to give you an example. These are Canadian authors, Canadian works in the past, what, probably in the past say five, six years or so. Uh, some of them are really well known. They all have to do with health. This is but a mere sample of the corpus that I'll be working on. So there's lots to do with that. All of these authors are still around and kicking, of course. Hopefully they're, they're still around. Yeah, all of them. So there's, there's lots to be done. Just to give you a sense, this is Canada. And the, the last, hopefully, part, it, it, it's tied actually to something, to, to another project that I did before on the emotional fabric of the suburbs of Edmonton. Uh, it was an online sort of mapping geolocation project that I did with colleagues here. And what I want to do is to extend the results of that past project into uncovering the invisible connections between how people think of their health and how they actually concretely inhabit the city. So proximity of health services. Can you see the hospital from your house? Do you think you're far enough? Can you, have, can you walk? All that sort of like physical relation to how you think of health for your family, for yourself, also based on the different cultural, uh, you know, backgrounds of people in a city like Edmonton and the healthcare system with its institutions. So these are the three, you know, angles of the research that hopefully will develop in the upcoming years. Now, like I said tonight, lots of questions. So let's look at the first one, which is what I want to bring. It's it's really the. Uh, reflexive ground from which I'm thinking, uh, from which I'm bringing this up, the personal narrative in today's biomedical world. So what I'm suggesting, there's one suggestion, the history, the history sorry, of modern medical visualization is also, is directly tied to the history of, to how medicine has influenced our conception of time, I should ask I should add, sorry, of personal time, like the way that we experience time. So there's a direct connection. Therefore, the influence of the various developments of medical visualization on our capacity to tell stories about ourselves and our body, well, it remains to be explored. There's so many things that remain to be tapped into to produce new knowledge in this day and age. Now, what, do I, what am I talking about when I, when I mention the history of medical visualization? Just to give you an idea, so first of all, you would have, this is broad strokes here, first of all you would have some, the symptomatology of the days of old in which the relation between, I mean the visualization if you will, was directly in a clinical setting between the practitioner, the, phys the physician and the patient. This led to what I call the age of transparency, example x-rays but one could also include the many types of scopies, like colonoscopy and so on. And then this leads into uh, this other type of visualization, which is the monitoring and the, stabiliza the stabilization of different, you know, mechanism, biological mechanisms in the body, in which you do rely on visual aspects and information in order to reconstruct, you know, what's going on. Uh, so in the first case, it's story-based. Obviously, the patient needs to tell about what's going on. And it focuses on the body as a whole. My knee hurts because, you know, yesterday I was repainting my ceiling and I fell down and so on and so forth. It has to do directly with the life story. In the second case, it's obviously, obviously visual-based. And I would argue that this is at that, at that conjuncture that... Uh, visual arts started to be interested in medicine, if one was to write an actual history of the whole thing. Uh, it, again, arguably, it, it, focus, uh, it focuses on organs much more than on the whole. And in the third case, it's measurement-based, and it does focus on bodily processes instead of organs, instead of the whole thing. Now, this leads us into what I think is really 
more interesting for our time, we're still talking about the visualization here. The first wave of digitization, digitization CT scans and MRI scans. I left out the PET scans because I think they have to do with injecting a liquid that then produces a sort of transparency. So let's just focus on those two to give you an idea. We're already looking at images that can be uh, examined through an aesthetic lens, especially the third one, right? So we are in a realm that doesn't have to do with only medicine anymore when it comes to, you know, exercising our analytical thought. And then one would look at the second wave of digitization, that is today. Data collection, encoding, and transmission. What do I mean by that? Well, different devices connected directly to your body. Of course, what they call the, what is being called today, the wearable health technologies. And eventually, the decoding of the genomes, or in this case, uh, uh, you know, design your ways of visualizing data with the chromosomes in this case. So this would be the second age of, this, uh, second wave of digitization. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about addressing a sort of progression development in medical visualization and how it affects the forms in which we think about our personal history, personal stories. This, these two uh, last waves are data-based and they focus on design because one has to visualize it in ways that are understandable and readability. So we've moved away completely from what we, from the clinical setting of the early days where one would rely only on the patient's story to tell, to say, you know, what was wrong. When I talk about the personal history, what am I really talking about? Well, I'm suggesting, and this really comes from the literary mind, the literary background, I'm suggesting that the body exists as a whole. This is what we suppose, we assume every day. But it exists as a whole only in retrospect. Only in the retrospection of the narrative mind. You think of your body as something that belongs to your own history in the past, but in the, in the present, not so sure, because so many things are going on, and next thing you know is that tomorrow, who knows where your body is going to take you, so to speak. Today's technologies do not have to do with retrospection at all. The ones that I was mentioning, uh, the, for the two waves of digitization. They are technologies of projection and of management. Ratio, risk, potential outcome, quality of life, health expectancy, all of these popular notions that are being thrown around today and are really useful. That's, I'm not criticizing necessarily what they are in a clinical setting. What I'm saying is that in terms of a story, well, now we have a shift that is almost a paradigm shift, if not precisely a paradigm shift. So if you look at this image, uh, <coughs> none of these you know, people represented around the table are working in, uh, they're, they're not relying on the past. There's a lawyer, there's probably an accountant, there's a pharmaceutical representative, there's a, a physician who's looking at data. All these people are managing information in the present tense about what is potentially a patient's health. Projection in the future, in this case, will disrupt the coherence of the body and will diffract its image. Consensual image, what I mean by that is that it's the way that we think of our body as a day-to-day -day thing. You'll see what I mean a bit more on the next slide. With the current state of medical visualization, we are witnessing the creation of a transitional state where there's no longer an analogon for the self. So you have the self who shows up in the clinic, sees the, or at the hospital, sees the nurse, sees the physician, speaks about their problems, uh, embarks on a process of, you know, healing and eventually goes back home or I mean if things go bad <laughs> dies but at least we have the transition now there's sort of opening a new space here which I call the transitional space in which there's not really an image of the body not really an image of the self this is what we call a health kit uh, 
health technology kit here with all the sensors connected to the screens. And sure enough, we have a little representation here. Stock images that I found free online, but it's just... Okay, so <clears throat> this is my visual representation of what I told you, just to make sure in the, in the time that's left that you know exactly what I'm grounding my reflection on. Traditionally, you have the individual in the center is the, the health practitioner. Let's call her or him the doctor in this case. Surrounded by the constellation of the traditional, so to speak, elements of the practice. So, you know, medical tools, pharmaceuticals, uh, heart rate monitor, we're, we're within the realm of what we know. It is a mutual relationship with what is obviously a patient on the right hand side. And these are the notions that we al always relied on so far in order to think of the patient as a character in a story, as an agent, as somebody with, you know, a depth to its person. So you have the family, you have what we call the support network, you have faith for some people, you have phys the physical condition, you have the medical history, you have the pain threshold, you have the, what we call the resilience, we all know about this word, this word, this term, and all of this arguably will fit into the medical life story. So when somebody thinks of themselves as a person undergoing, you know, uh, a journey in through, into the biomedical world, well then they will include it in their life story because all of this is at hand. Like we know that. That's a culture. That is the culture that we inherit today. Now, this transitional space that I was telling you about. Here's the patient of today. No matter what disease or illness or affliction is dawning upon them. You have these new, this new constellation. Electronic health record, data security, encoding, infographics design, because we have to be able to read the big data when there's too much information. A biohacking, all of these notions of ratio, level, performance, risk, the sensors, connectedness, wearable health tech, the providers, insurance or not, it could be also the network provider for simply a connection to the internet. Of course, the social network data sharing, talking about the medical data here. Uh, and we have words that act as umbrellas for that, because we're still trying to cling to an image of the self. So there's this popular word of lifestyle, which I'll have you notice doesn't have much to do with the future or the past. It has to do with how you see yourself, you know, living the good life today, a form of life. And we have this other very popular word, which I would challenge anyone here to define, mindfulness, which is supposed to save us. Now, <laughs> it's, I try to make it as visually impactful as possible. And oh, what you have is now, you have to go through that in order to get back to that. So the loop is now uh, three part time. Like there's three elements to the loop. Quickly, last slide. So we end up with questions that can interest literary people just as much, I think, as people in the health humanities realm. What are the care at large? At large, what are the characters of medical visualization today? By character, I don't necessarily mean a person. What are the agents? For instance, is illness an agent? Does it act? Does it have a role in your personal story? Or is it just a set of circumstances? Or more interestingly, with what I just brought up, is illness just a cloud of information? I mean, people still die, it's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, how do we visualize it? How do we integrate it as something in a story? There you go, that would be the ultimate question. Where's the story now? Just to put it in a nutshell. Now, <clears throat> In order to make this just a little bit more concrete, I'm going to take two minutes to wrap this up with some questions or maybe just slight openings for you to think about that are way more concrete. S uh, just examples, examples. There's like hopefully a million more concrete questions and potential applications of the, these insights. How to, like for instance, how to address a patient after 
a, na a nano, nano surgery intervention. You do know that the nanotechnologies are booming, uh, you know, provided that hospitals and, 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 and communities have the funds to, for them, but the research on them is booming. And we're looking at a world in which potentially part of the surgeries that we do will be performed by nanobots and that sort of thing, like this, these microscopic, non-visual, non-visible, sorry, non-visible interventions on the body. We have all kinds of, you know, counseling and psychological skills to address somebody recovering from an ordeal such as a surgery because we can point to obvious things. When the, the surgery has happened inside the body and we don't see it, how do you psychologically address the transformations thereof? Another question, what are the proportions that cause a medical story to become unnarratable? If it's too small, if it's too big? How to include chronic illness in this context? How do you produce, for practitioners, for, uh, uh, for therapy, how to produce reports on suffering and assess them when the sense of self of the patient is diffracted by the way that we monitor his body? These are just examples. And finally, I'm going to leave you with that. How to read and potentially answer such questions in the works of contemporary writers, but also narrative artists. It's all around us. And yeah, I'm just going to leave you with that because I can go on and on. Thank you. Um, so thank you to Marilyn and Pam for including me uh, this evening. Um, my focus is a little bit different than what Sean and Danielle have presented. My focus is more on the process that we experienced and underwent through through the project um, that Sean had mentioned, the See Me, Hear Me, Heal Me project. So for the females in the room, um, in the audience, you've all undergone pap smears to test for cervical cancer screening. For the men, um, I tried to say this without laughing, but the digital rectal exam for prostate, exam, uh, prostate cancer screening. You've all undergone these cancer screening processes, but how many of you in the audience have actually had a head and neck cancer screening done within the last year? Wow, take a look around the room. It's very, very few. And so this is really kind of the driving force behind um, one of the reasons why we wanted to embark upon the project, which looked at head and neck cancer and um, just the public awareness surrounding this type of cancer because it is so small. How many of you have heard of Manuary? Nobody. How many of you have heard of Movember? Wow. Everybody knows about the mustache. But nobody knows about the month, January, for head and neck cancer awareness. So, um, head and neck cancer actually accounts for about 4% of all new cancer cases in Canada and about 3% of all new cancer deaths. Um, and while there is a moderate decrease in its prevalence, it's actually increasing because of its association with HPV or um, human papilloma related viruses. Um, that cause oral pharyngeal cancers. And so the prevalence of this cancer is actually expected to surpass cervical cancer by 2020, which is a scary prospect. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with head and neck cancer, um, its treatment often results in various forms of disfigurement, as well as dysfunctions, such as speech and swallowing um, impairments. And there's also um, visual disfigurement that's affiliated or as a result of this cancer and its treatment. It has severe, I would say severe, um, impacts on psychosocial uh, interactions as well because of these impairments and disfigurements. So despite all of this, head and neck cancer awareness is still um, limited in our public space. So um, imagine walking into a doctor's office and getting the news you have cancer. So I imagine that this moment feels like the cancer has um, put an abrupt end to your life story, life story that Daniel was talking about up to that point. 
And after you've had an opportunity to absorb this news, um, I would imagine that this juncture may be a point of critical disconnection, a moment you experience deep pain of not being understood and not understanding others. You feel cut off from those with whom you share a relationship with because your illness experience impacts you in every way and is so very personal. But what if this painful moment of disconnection might be transformed into a powerful moment of connection? And this is kind of where my focus of the presentation will be today. So um, advancements in neuroimaging, and we've talked a lot about neuroimaging today, I feel. Um, advancements in neuroimaging techniques uh, such as fMRI has vastly elevated our understanding of the human brain. What we know today is that relationships are crucial to brain development and neural functioning throughout the life cycle. The brain is actually constructed through our interactions with others and designed to be altered by relationship experiences. So Daniel Siegel, who is the director of Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA, calls this interpersonal neurobiology, highlighting the connectedness between relationships, emotion, and the brain. In other words, it identifies how the brain is wired through relationships and connection. Therefore, um, I propose to you that being connected and living in connection with others is in our neurobiology. It's why we're here. Even if we see this non, we see this even in non-human species. So researchers have found that baboon mothers who spent the most time grooming and socializing with other baboon mothers and other females were more relaxed, they were better mothers, and had infants that were more likely to survive. This calls to question, or I had a fleeting thought of quitting my day job and finding a fellow mother to groom for the sake of my children. <laughs> it was fleeting, though. So um, research has has, research has also documented the positive impact that nurturing relationships can have on one's physical as well as emotional health. But um, it's also shown how social rejection activates the same parts of the brain that respond to physical pain. So you see that there, therefore the connection, this sense of love and belonging, the feel, feeling of being worthy, is actually life-giving. But I bring you back to the point of uh, disconnection that um, one experiences through a diagnosis like head and neck cancer. The question is, how does one repair this disconnection? How does one actually reconnect? So we need to, we need to be seen, we need to be heard, we need, to be, we need to feel like we were felt in order to develop this connection. We need to see, hear, feel in order to heal. Another critical element in uh, building authentic connection is this idea of vulnerability. And vulnerability is um, a really, really exposing of our true self. It lets us be seen and drives one, one's willingness to reach out and invest in a relationship. That is an authentic relationship. So think about a moment in any given relationship that each of you have had, I'm sure, and if you haven't, um, you know, I'm here, we can talk about this after. <laughs> but think about that moment where um, your relationship is transformed from a casual acquaintance to a meaningful, authentic relationship. And if you take a moment to reflect, I'm sure that you will be able to identify that one moment where you or the other person had become vulnerable, become open, and willing, and being willing to let that other person in. So vulnerability to me, when I thought of it as a visual metaphor, was like an open door. It said, come on in, take a seat. Stay a while. 
So today, rather than focusing on the body of work or the artwork that um, really was developed in response to the See Me, Hear Me, Heal Me project in which Sean and Brad were participants in, I wanted to focus more on um, the process, oops, I this is not on a timer, on the process of around our, the relational aspect of this project that arose from working really intimately with patients. So back in 2015, a group of patients, artists, and researchers from art and design, anthropology, communication sciences, medicine and dentistry, as well as surgery, came together to collaborate as well as co-build an arts-based knowledge translation installation to make visible the experience of patients um, treated for head and neck cancer, which are often left unarticulated and hidden. So we first began our journey um, collecting narratives, and these were the lived stories of patients as well as their families. We wanted to hear their stories, the lens that the of, to the patient's experiences. So these narratives were then followed by um, a participatory theater-based workshop that was led by an individual named David Diamond, who's the director of Theater for a Living out in Vancouver who really engaged us in an introductory session. And I'm not sure if um, any of you have participated in these image-based workshops, but really it's an embodied way of creating images so that there's an understanding of story, um, an experience, but it's also shared, it's a shared experience. It's generated together. And what you see here is um, one of those images and it's really an involved process without going into too much detail but it really fosters um, an interactive uh, dialogue it maybe not through words but an interactive dialogue between all the participants so I believe that this workshop fostered a supportive and safe environment for um, honest interactions it provided a foundation, or it developed a foundation to build a trusting relationship across participants. It was a point where participants could at least grab the door handle and turn, perhaps not fully opening it to what was, or welcoming the person on the other side, but a gesture towards this. One of our participants shared with us, although intimidating at first, I was so impressed by the range of community present I felt honored to be counted amongst them. It left me hopeful and feeling much less isolated. And although doubtful as I may have been before my involvement, I am certain now that my story can be shared. So after months of continual dialogue between artists and patients, um, <coughs> we further expanded our evolving relationship through artist studio visits, and a feedback session um, on the artist's conceptual ideas as well as preliminary works. And this is where the team was not only able to share dialogue around their, our collective journey together about what we heard, what we felt, but also it gave us the first glimpse into the body of visual art that would eventually be developed, um, um, that responded to the stories that we heard, that responded to the feelings that we all felt and perhaps even um, the ability to see the person that was living with a head and neck cancer by way of interacting through the art that was, that was shown. Oops, so, sorry. So I present to you one of our initial works, thanks to Brad. Um, what is your initial reaction to this piece? What would have been your initial reaction? thinking of the vulnerable population that we were dealing with. So I'll share you mine, my reaction. My first reaction was, I was horrified. Um, I was shocked. I said, no patients um, will agree to this. They will be appalled, they will be horrified. No offense, Brad. Um, <laughs> they will be offended. Um, and clinicians on our interprofessional uh, interdisciplinary team also expressed this because our first reaction was to protect the patient. To our surprise, the patients shared, this is reality. This is our reality. 
you have captured a key aspect of the experience of head and neck cancer. It takes apart your identity. So think back to the, um, think back to the metaphor of vulnerability. Vulnerability being an open door. The patient's vulnerability, their willingness to be seen, to share their true self, offered an open door for us, us who had no intimate knowledge of head and neck cancer, to, part, to walk through and transform our relationship from mere partners on a project to developing an authentic connection with one another. So it was through this vulnerability and authentic connection that began the healing process, not just of patients and their families, but I believe of all of us. So I go back to the idea of being connected living in connection with others, being a fundamental need in humans. This also brings me, um, this also means that we are wired to feel what others feel and that feelings are contagious. Think about the last time when somebody around you laughed hysterically, a deep, meaningful laugh, and how that made you feel. Think about seeing somebody who cried and how it brought you sorrow. I remember a time, um, and this is really early on in terms of being a mom, I plunked my three-year-old in front of CBC and turned on a program called Roly Poly Oly. Anybody know the show? It's a show of a family of robots, and in this particular episode, um, there was a flower that was planted in the garden, and Zoe, the little girl robot, um, was talking to this flower, and this flower started to cry. And I looked over at my three-year-old daughter, and she had tears welling up in her eyes. And I said, are you sad? And she looked at me, and she said, Mommy, the flower is sad. I'm sad. I want the flower to see the sun. And this just really reiterates the, path, the, the fact that um, we are wired to feel what others feel. And that is actually what drives our relationships. So that means that even though we may not have directly experienced head and neck cancer, we can feel what somebody has experienced um, going through this. Likewise, I think we can also share the feelings of their healing process. One patient actually shared in one of our reflections, um, I am in awe of this community. This is a promise and the power of the work, or us working together, of bringing our collective strengths, our collective willingness to look each other in the eye, to see me, to hear me, to heal me, to heal all of us. So I asked you earlier, what if a painful moment of disconnection might be transformed into a powerful moment of reconnection? It is what I believe through our shared experiences, our willingness to see, hear, and, and feel, and to be open to one's vulnerability that moves us from being disconnected to being authentically connected. And it is through a, a relational process that I believe the artists were able to develop a body of work that was meaningful and authentic to the patients, but also to the larger community of healthcare workers who provide um, care to head and neck cancer patients, for, pa for people who actually experience um, traumatic illness, for families who have walked alongside their loved ones, for those who, who actually have no context of understanding. I believe that this is relevant to all of us. So, based on a suggestion of one of our patient partners, a body of, of reflections was actually developed and incorporated into our last exhibition that was at the McMullen Gallery at the hospital across the street. And these reflections were really meant to provide viewers another access point for a visceral understanding of head and neck cancer illness experience. And I really wanted to share this reflection with you. And it was actually pre-recorded, but our technology doesn't work. So I'm going to just fly by the seat of my pants. And I'm going to actually ask Pat and Bernie, who are actually here tonight, 
if they would indulge us and read this reflection. Yes, so come on up. <laughs> together five months after his surgery. He was unwilling to speak. For months he wrote lots of notes. My own voice was not as strong as I wanted at that point in my life. Our struggle to rediscover and regain our respective voices was lessened together. The lessons of medicine, research surgeon, Researching and investigation. Art is a way of seeing rather than just doing. Love and art are a process of exploration and discovery. Art, art medicine, medicine, and love. That entry into my life reflects a metaphorical triptic. A medical caregiver, the comforts of love, and an artistic gift provided inspiration and meaning to the depths of my soul. Art, medicine, and love. This metaphorical triptych sometimes emerges when head and neck cancer strikes. A face, a tongue, an eye, ear, nose, throat, or some other part of our always vulnerable being. Cancer incites closure, not only of wounds, but suppression of expression and healthy human interaction. Art, Art medicine, medicine, and, and love. love. So just in closing, um, if, if you walk away with nothing else, um, the one message or the key thing that I want to communicate is that authentic connection, regardless of whether, where it arises, through research, through art, through dialogue, I believe is a healing connection. So thank you. I'm really, really delighted and proud of um, U of A for hosting the first Lays Robert. Uh, um, and as I said, there will be many more, I hope. We're planning another one for the end of this term. And then we also have two set up for next term. One will be on climate change, and the second will be um, on deep learning on ethnomusicology. If you would like to be kept um, informed of those, then there's a sign-up sheet at the front. Please do um, sign on. But we'll be making sure we post it far and wide, so hopefully you won't be able to miss it. Um, part of the laser remit um, is this idea of coming together and, and being together in the same space. I think that was a really interesting um, note that came through almost all the talks, with that importance of actually being together and sitting in a room and discussing uh, through art and science projects, and um, so I hope that was something that we will continue. Um, I would like to invite if anybody has any art and science projects that they'd like to share with us. I know maybe we're a bit shy to do so on the first time. Uh, no, but please, next time, if you have something you would like to share, please, you will have a forum to be able to tell everybody. Because if there are art and science projects going on, or art projects, or science projects you'd like to share, we all want to know. I do. I personally want to know, and I think everybody is here in this room because they're interested and want to be part of this community. Um, I'd like to also remind you, please do come down to the Fab Gallery. There is complimentary wine and cheese and biscuits, and hopefully we can continue a discussion um, with the speakers and amongst ourselves. 
And, and also, if um, you might just check off that you're here, if you registered earlier, or add your name, and uh, we'll make sure to also have that way of connecting with you, communicating with you over time. So, shoot are down here. Um, before we go, do we have any questions? Do we have any question cards that would like to be collected, or if anybody would like I just, to I just ask, <laughs> or like just if anybody would like to ask a question to any of our speakers? I was. Um, I have a question for Daniel, um, because during your talk, I was wondering, because you made this connection of uh, like telling, telling like the medical narrative of the individual, and I was wondering when you showed all those different um, elements that are part of that, how social media moves into that, because there's this development of people sharing or asking for medical advice online and taking pictures of of, of their. Issue or of, of, of what concerns them, that they post it online and then say, hey, does anybody know what that is, or what shall I do? And then there's like people saying, yeah, it's this and this and this, until finally someone says, why don't you go to a doctor? Because like, you know, so, and it's also very visual, right? So, so how does that fit into your, or like, is there a connection is to your argument? Might as well stand up. Thank you, yeah. Um, it, I was gonna say it fits in three ways, uh, social media. The first one is, it can be summed up by the word immediacy, I think, mm -hmm. because with the uh, da data collection, say there's this, so we have the Apple Watch, for instance, has, or even your phones, they have a, now a help kit if you use Apple, and potentially the data can be sent directly over a network of other people who are using the same technology, and then you have your own social media network on there, and, be, and you're gonna take your morning run, and they're gonna be Johnny, Tom, Dick, or, Glenda in Australia that are going to be that are going to go good work you're running your time so there's this it builds these sort of uh, weird little disconnected communities geographically disconnected communities with the immediacy of no no human contact anymore I feel like I'm not really fielding your question in a good way but this is how I thought of social media playing in there it's the suppression of the the direct relation between you and your performance and to have it mediated by somebody else who's elsewhere it can sort of immediately react to what you're doing and therefore create this space in which everything is decorporalized what you were referring to i didn't think about and that's really interesting to have these online communities where people will post will post their symptoms mm -hmm. and then people will react to that I'm really aware that's your question. This, thanks for it, because I didn't think of that. I'm, I'm afraid to go look at these things, because so far what I think of these, these spaces online is that they will reinforce, what is the English word for that? I feel like it's the same one in French. When you think that you're sick all the time, but you're not. Hypochondria, Hypochondria exactly. So that, I think it just reinforces social behaviors that are not really working uh, well for anyone. But... <laughs> Have any more questions? No? Maybe we can continue on downstairs and then people who are shy to ask the questions now can ask in the back. Thank you very much.